the basis of all 3GS apps. In the previous video we reviewed the starting template for your first 3GS app. We reviewed the basics of using modules and JavaScript class syntax. Not all developers have moved over to ES6 class syntax and modules, so I hope you'll forgive me for my brief reminder of this type of coding using JavaScript. Now we're ready to create our first app. Open the file app.js in the folder Start Lecture 4. And in the constructor method we'll create a virtual camera. When we imported the 3GS library we imported every class by using the wildcard character and the name 3 in caps. Each new instance of a class from this library needs to use the name 3 followed by a dot and then the name of the class. We're going to create a perspective camera. This takes four parameters. Parameter 1 is a field of view in degrees. Here we use 60 degrees. Then the aspect ratio. Because we're filling the entire window we use inner width divided by inner height. This ensures the models we create aren't stretched. Whatever device layout you use. Parameters 3 and 4 deal with the near and far values of this camera. Any attempt to render a pixel that's nearer than the near value or further away than the far value will be ignored. A virtual camera is something called a frustrum and the viewer will only see objects that are inside the field of view and the near and far planes, like this. And we also set the position of the camera. As well as a virtual camera, a 3GS app needs an instance of a scene. This takes no parameters. Like a 3GS perspective camera, the base class for a 3GS scene is an object 3D. It's a great idea to open the 3GS website when developing 3GS apps. Go to documentation and enter the class name. For a scene, notice object 3D at the top, then an arrow. Clicking object 3D we see that object 3D is the base class for most objects in 3GS. Because it's a special kind of object 3D, a scene will have a children property that's an array of child objects. More about that later. We're going to set the background colour to a mid-grey colour. The colour value is provided in hexadecimal format. Using 0x tells the JavaScript interpreter to expect a hexadecimal value. In decimal there are 10 possible numeric values in a single column. Once we get to 9 and increase by 1, then the next value takes two columns. Each column to the left has a value 10 times the one to its right. So in this column the 1 actually represents 10. In hexadecimal there are 16 numeric values. For 10 we use the letter A. For 11 B, up to 15 B and F. Using this approach a single column can represent the values 0 through to 15. Adding 1 to 15 we roll into the next column. A column is 16 times the column to its right. This value in hexadecimal isn't 10, it's 16. When we define a colour, the first two characters after the 0x give the value of the red channel. AA is 10 times 16 plus 10, or 170 in decimal. Each colour channel taking a value between 0 and 255. FF is 15 times 16 plus 15, which equals 255, and is the largest value in hexadecimal using just two columns. The middle two characters provide the value for the green channel, and the last two the blue value. Before we can see any content from our 3GS scene, we need a renderer. 3GS has a number of renderers, but the one we need for our apps is the WebGL renderer. You can optionally pass a parameters object to the constructor. And here we're going to set anti-alias to true to reduce the jaggies along the edges. It's a good idea to use the render method set pixel ratio. This will avoid blurring on retina screens and it's essential to set the physical size of the renderer. Here we set the renderer to the full size of the window using inner width 
and inner height. When a WebGL renderer is created, it creates an HTML5 canvas element with the property name DOM element. And we need to add this to the container we created earlier. The renderer needs to render the scene repeatedly so that changes to the camera position or objects in the scene are constantly updated. And we can set up an animation loop to do just that. It will take the render method of the app as a parameter. And don't forget to use bind this to ensure the scope inside the function is the app instance. Now this method will be called around 60 times a second. Slide down to the render method and add a call to the render method of the renderer. This takes the scene as parameter 1 and the camera as parameter 2. Now if we test this in the browser using live server you should see a grey screen. It might seem like a lot of effort to get a grey screen but there's actually a lot going on. Let's review the code. The minimum any 3GS app requires is a scene where we'll add objects and lights, a camera that acts as the viewer's position and orientation in the scene, and you will need a renderer, usually a WebGL renderer instance. In this code snippet we first created a camera. In this instance we used a perspective camera so distant objects will appear smaller than close objects. When creating a perspective camera you pass parameters to the constructor method. Parameter 1 is the field of view, the FOV, this is in degrees. The second parameter is the aspect ratio, the width of the window divided by its height. Because we're using the whole size of the window we can use the inner width and inner height properties of the window object when calculating this aspect ratio. Parameter 3 is the near value and parameter 4 the far value. Objects nearer than parameter 3 will be clipped and those further away than parameter 4 will also be clipped. Real-time computer graphics uses a virtual cage to define a clipping region. This cage is called a frustrum and although it might be tempting to set near to a tiny value and far to a massive one, the recommendation is to keep within a smaller range as your scene will require. The renderer uses a special buffer when it builds up the image to display and this buffer stores the distance away from the camera for each pixel it's rendered and it allows nearer objects to mask distant ones. The accuracy of this masking is determined by the range between near and far. If this range is measured in the millions when in fact your objects never exceed the range 100 then you're likely to get rendering errors. Once the camera is created it will be at 000, zero, zero looking directly down the negative z axis. Recall that WebGL has by default x increasing to the right, the east, y increasing upwards and z increasing out of the screen, south. Here we move the camera back to 4 in the z. Think of it as 4 meters from the origin. After creating the camera we create the scene. This is easily done and requires no parameters and by default the background will be white. To alter this we change the background colour to grey using an instance of a 3GS colour class. The colour class can take a hex value to set its colour. Then we create the renderer. It's an instance of a WebGL renderer with anti-aliasing set to true. Without setting anti-aliasing to true the app will suffer from jaggies. It's important to set the pixel ratio, otherwise there's a danger of blurring on many devices and it's essential to set the size of the renderer. Here, because we're filling the window, we use inner width and height of the window object. When a renderer is created, it creates a DOM element and this should be added to the container to ensure it's visible. The renderer has a method called setAnimationLoop that takes a callback, a method. Here we use the class method render and to ensure our scope is the app instance we add bind this to the reference. The set animation loop is called up to 60 times a second if the browser can sustain that rate. It's an alternative to using refresh animation frame. So now we have the key ingredients of all 3GS apps, a scene, camera and renderer. And the renderer is being called many times a second. But grey 
it's a bit boring. In the next video we'll fix that by adding your first 3GS object.